Ich grüße Sie sehr herzlich. Auf meiner Rede steht sehr geehrte und dann geht es weiter. Meine Damen und Leute sagen Moin Moin. Ähm, weil ich das Gefühl habe, wir sind mitten in Norddeutschland und ähm, als gebürtiger Oldenburger habe ich das Gefühl, äh, wieder zugehören zu dürfen. In diesem Sinne, liebe Frau Schamberger, lieber Herr Platzer, toll, dass wir wegen Ihnen heute hier sein dürfen, Ihre Antrittsvorlesung hören dürfen. Sehr geehrter Herr Oldenburg, ähm, als Doktorvater von beiden unserer neuen Professuren, toll, dass Sie den Weg aus Oldenburg hierher gefunden haben. Ähm, sehr geehrte Familie, freue ich mich sehr, dass Sie da sind und ähm, Herrn Platzer begleiten. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste von äh, verschiedenen Orten, ähm, bei mir steht auch auf jedes Geburtstagskind. Ich werde das nicht vertiefen, weil ich nicht weiß, ob es alle wissen und ich auch niemanden sozusagen kompromittieren möchte, aber steht hier drauf. Und dann habe ich mir sagen lassen und kann es ja auch selber bestätigen, Oldenburg und Karlsruhe haben ziemlich viele Ähnlichkeiten. Und ich weiß nicht, ob das jedem von Ihnen bewusst ist. Ähm, rein topografisch ist es in beiden Fällen total flach. Also wenn Sie hier aus dem Fenster gucken, müssen Sie ziemlich weit gucken, um den ersten Berg zu sehen, da hinten. Und wenn Sie in Oldenburg aus dem Fenster gucken, ist da auch die Brücke über die Hunte. Das ist der einzige Berg, den es dort gibt. Und danach kommt dann der äh, Deich Richtung Nordsee. Also von daher, da ist Einigkeit, was mir gar nicht so bewusst wurde. Ich weiß nicht, ob unsere Flagge, die badische Flagge, die kann man da hinten sehen. Wir haben eine Karlsruher Stadtflagge, die ist... Ähm, Rot-Gelb gestreift. Wissen Sie, wie die Flagge von Oldenburg ist? Rot-Gelb gestreift. Aber Sie haben irgendwie drei Streifen, wir haben zwei Streifen. Große Ähnlichkeit. Oldenburg wurde 2009 als Stadt der Wissenschaft ausgezeichnet. Karlsruhe versteht sich als Wissenschaftsstadt. Wir haben neun Hochschulen am Standort. Das sind neun verschiedene Hochschultypen. Das ist keine andere Stadt, das neun verschiedene Typen von der pädagogischen über die Kunsthochschule, über die Fachhochschule, Fach Fach Hochschule für Angewandte. Wissenschaften und natürlich die Universität, wie heute das KIT ist und viele andere mehr. Ähm, das Thema Bahnverbindung, ich weiß nicht, wie Sie die Reise auf sich genommen haben, aber wir haben Experten hier im Raum, die sich mit Graphentheorien auskennen. Also ich bin mir sicher, dass der Weg Oldenburg-Karlsruhe mit viel Umsteigen zu tun hat, äh, in der heutigen Zeit mit viel Risiko zu tun hat. Und ich vermute, dass der Weg in beide Richtungen gleich lang dauert. Ähm, das muss so nicht sein, das kann so sein. Da Fragen wir dann äh, die Expertinnen und Experten, warum die das besser wissen. Ich ähm, freue mich also, dass wir viele Gäste hier haben, Gäste aus Karlsruhe, Gäste aus äh, Pittsburgh, aber eben auch ganz viele Gäste aus Norddeutschland am Karlsruher Institut für Technologie, dem KIT. Wir nennen uns und wir fühlen uns auch als die Forschungsuniversität in der Helmholtz-Gemeinschaft. Und wenn ich sage, die Forschungsuniversität in der Helmholtz-Gemeinschaft, der Euro, ich nehme Sie jetzt als einen stellvertretenden Professor einer normalen deutschen Universität, dann zeichnen sich eben Universitäten dadurch aus, dass sie eine, zwei große Aufgaben haben, das ist im Prinzip, ähm, Forschung und Lehren. Ähm, dafür brauchen wir die Studierenden, weil sonst macht Lehren keinen Sinn. Und für Forschung brauchen wir natürlich die Professorinnen und Professoren, die in ihren Lehrstühlen das entsprechend ähm, umsetzen. Es gibt in Deutschland eine zweite Wissenschaftswelt außerhalb der Universitäten, weil sie außerhalb der Universitäten sind, nennt man sie auch die außeruniversitäre Forschung, die vom Bund finanziert wird. Das ist Max Planck, das ist Fraunhofer, das ist Helmholtz und die leibniz institute Und zwischen diesen beiden Welten gibt es eine riesengroße steinerne Mauer, die heißt Föderalismus. Und diese Föderalismusmauer ist nicht überwindbar, weil natürlich im Grundgesetz drinsteht, was die Länder dürfen und was der Bund darf. Und die Länder sind auch sehr, sehr pingelig, dass der Bund nicht in die Hoheit eingreift. Es gibt ein paar Tricks, die der Bund anwendet. Diejenigen, die Familien und Kinder haben, kennen den Trick des Baus der Schulen. Also Länder sind immer klamm und dann kommt der Bund und sagt, wir bauen euch ganz viele Gebäude, wenn ihr Länder in den Gebäuden unsere Lehrkonzepte umsetzt. Also so kann man dann als Bund Einfluss nehmen die Länder. Das hat der Bund auch bei den Universitäten getan, hat gesagt, wir machen mal eine Exzellenzinitiative und ihr Universitäten strengt euch mal alle an und äh, folgt den Zielen, die wir als Bundesrepublik haben, äh, Leuchttürme setzen, Exzellenz ausweisen ähm, und Universitäten strategenfähig machen, was für Universitäten kein Selbstläufer ist. Für uns hat es, und diejenigen, die schon lange das KIT kennen, wissen, die Geschichte hat 2006 begonnen, ähm, 2009 ähm, wurden wir dann gegründet, 2012 wurde unser Gesetz weiterentwickelt ähm, und seit 2021, das ist jetzt juristisch, ich bin nur Ingenieur, haben wir ein neues Gesetz und ohne dieses Gesetz hätten wir beispielsweise Herrn Platzer wahrscheinlich 
nicht gewonnen. Und ohne die Exzellenzinitiative hätten wir sie und Frau Schwamberger nicht bekommen, gewonnen, weil wir über dieses Gesetz und über die Exzellenzinitiative uns neue Instrumente geschaffen haben, das Berufungssystem umzustellen. Also wir kannten als reine technische Universität die Juniorprofessur nicht wirklich. Die Informatik ist das ein Vorbild, die hat das nun mit angefangen und hat ein paar Juniorprofessuren eingerichtet. Als Maschinenbauer kann ich sagen, das war für uns völlig fremd und auch überhaupt nicht so in unsere Welt hineinpassend. Die damalige, eine der damaligen Bundesministerin, Frau Wanker, hat das 100 oder 1000 oder 1000 Professurenprogramm aufgelegt, wo man sich dann bewerben konnte und Juniorprofessuren kriegen konnte, wenn man ein bestimmtes Konzept aufgelegt hat. Wir als Karlsruhe haben auch ein solches Konzept geschrieben, haben 15 Anträge gestellt, einige in diesem Raum erinnern sich noch, neun sind genehmigt worden bei elf Fakultäten, ähm, hat dann das Präsidium gesagt, dann das schenken wir doch den beiden Fakultäten, die nicht gewonnen haben, auch noch je eine, sodass jede Fakultät sich mit diesem Prozess der Juniorprofessur auseinandersetzen musste. Und das ist für eine Universität ein totaler, neudeutsch würde man sagen, Game Changer, Changer weil wir normalerweise Professorinnen und Professoren auswählen nach ihrer wissenschaftlichen Expertise. Also was haben sie im Leben geleistet und sind sie schon professorabel? Und nur wenn sie das sind, werden sie auch berufen. Ein Juniorprofessor kann das nicht sein, weil sie am Anfang ihrer Karriere steht. Das heißt, alle diese Kriterien, die man auf eine Professur anwendet, gelten überhaupt gar nicht, sondern man muss auf das Potenzial und auf die Zukunft setzen. Und das haben wir gelernt. Inzwischen haben wir sehr, sehr viele Juniorprofessuren am KIT und entwickeln das weiter, haben ein 100 Professurenprogramm aufgelegt. Dieses 100 Professurenprogramm führt dazu, dass wir als KIT dauerhaft 60 Juniorprofessuren haben wollen, 10 pro Jahr. Die sind in der Regel sechs Jahre da, deswegen kommen wir auf 60. Nicht alle bleiben sechs Jahre da, manche lassen sie früher oder später evaluieren. Und so werden wir es schaffen, auch den großen anstehenden Generationswechsel, so um die Jahre 2030, da werden sehr, sehr viele in den Ruhestand gehen, genügend Nachwuchs zu generieren. Und wir werden es schaffen, dass die Juniorprofessur an einer richtig technischen Universität ein gleichwertiger zweiter Karrierefahrt ist. Und Frau Schwamberger, Sie sind da sozusagen eine von denen, die das jetzt auch lebt und durchlebt und werden dann hoffentlich auch dauerhaft hier bei uns in Karlsruhe tätig bleiben. Das Zweite, was wir aus der Exzellenz uns herausgearbeitet haben, ist, dass wir also Universitäten, wenn sie exzellent sein wollen, brauchen sichtbar am Ende Köpfe. Menschen, die sichtbar sind, nur Preise, Leibnizpreise, Humboldt-Professuren, Forschungspreise der Länder und der Bünde und Humboldt-Professuren zu bekommen, ist von der Beckert, Sie wissen das ganz genau, weil Sie haben den Antrag geschrieben, ziemlich kompliziert. Also man braucht eine Person, die gewillt ist, aus dem Ausland nach Deutschland zu kommen. Man braucht eine Universität, die gewillt ist, viel Geld in die Hand zu nehmen. Dann muss man Verhandlungen führen und muss sagen, also wir würden das gerne tun, aber man darf erst unterschreiben, nachdem Humboldt genehmigt ist. Das heißt, dazwischen gibt es so ein Jahr oder fast ein Jahr Vakuumzeit. Einerseits hat man verhandelt, andererseits weiß man nicht, ob Humboldt kommt. Wenn Humboldt nicht kommt, was macht man dann? Und wenn Humboldt kommt, ist alles gut. Herr Platzer, wir hatten das Glück, Humboldt ist gekommen, aber wir waren uns handels einig, was gewesen wäre, wenn Herr Humboldt nicht gekommen wäre. Dafür haben wir aus der Exzellenzwelt heraus uns ein Ersatzmodell geschaffen. Wir nennen das die Otto Lehmann Professur, die nach gleichem Volumen, Finanzvolumen ausgestattet ist und ich nenne es mal als eine Art Rückfallposition greifen würde. Das können wir nicht beliebig oft machen und jedes Mal, wenn wir es nicht ziehen müssen, die Karte, haben wir sie frei für eine Folgeprofessur. Ich selber habe jetzt in meinen zehn Jahren KIT etwa 200 Berufungsverhandlungen geführt und ich darf an der Stelle sagen, Frau Schwanberger, wir beide haben im Gespräch aus meiner Erinnerung irgendwie viel Freude gehabt. Es war ein tolles Gespräch und es hat sich irgendwie auch, vielleicht liegt das an der gleichen Historie, und Sie sind rein um Moin gesagt, und dann haben Sie sofort irgendwie den Draht zu mir gefunden. Und deshalb habe ich auch bei der Antrittsvorlesung gesagt, da komme ich selbstverständlich, was ich normalerweise nicht in Kalender kriege. Und Herr Platzer, ich weiß nicht, ob ich das an der Stelle so sagen darf, aber wir haben mindestens sechs oder sieben intensivste Videokonferenzen geführt äh, über lange Zeit und haben uns über ganz, ganz viele Dinge verständigt. Und mein Eindruck war, Sie hatten das Gefühl, dass Sie in mich und ich hatte das Gefühl, dass ich in Sie vertrauen kann. Äh, und das hat am Ende zum Ergebnis geführt. Und aus dieser, aus dieser Situation heraus, und das ist für mich ein, heute eine echte Premiere, ich bin im zehnten Jahr im KIT und bin das allererste Mal bei einer Antrittsvorlesung dabei. Das sind meine Grußworte. In diesem Sinne freue ich mich auch riesig auf das Vertrauen. Und weiß nicht, wem ich jetzt das Wort gebe, in welcher Reihenfolge es weitergeht. Sie haben das Wort. In dem Sinne sind Sie alle ganz herzlich willkommen.
Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident Hans Seeker, sehr geehrter Herr Dekan Wecker, liebe Frau Schwamberger, lieber Herr Platzer, sehr geehrte Teilnehmende. Ich habe mich sehr gefreut über diese Einladung zur heutigen Antrittsvorlesung von Maike Schwamberger und André Platzer an das KIT. Es ist mir eine besondere Freude, als Doktorvater daran teilnehmen zu können und eine kurze Ansprache zu halten. Ich möchte jetzt über beide Antrittsprofessuren alphabetisch kurz was sagen. Zunächst über Herrn Platzer. Er hat ja bereits äh, Wurzeln in Karlsruhe gehabt, seine Ausbildung hier genossen, ein Master in Karlsruhe abgeschlossen. Und dann kam er 2004 bis 2008 als Doktorand in meine Arbeitsgruppe Correct System Design. Und äh, das funktionierte deshalb so gut, weil wir damals gerade einen Sonderforschungsbereich hatten, einen Transregio-Sonderforschungsbereich. Oldenburg, Freiburg, Saarbrücke mit Sprecher in Oldenburg, Werner Damm. Und äh, Herr Platzer hat dort in einem Projekt gearbeitet über den Bereich hybride Systeme. Und er hatte eine wunderbare Forschungsidee, nämlich seine Welt der dynamischen Logik, die er hier kennengelernt hat in Karlsruhe, zu verbinden und zu erweitern zur Behandlung von hybriden Systemen. Dynamische Logik war typischerweise für diskrete Programme, also etwas flexibler wie Rorsche Logik. Man, man kann es wunderbar kombinieren, Programme, Formeln neu verbinden und bei den normalen Programmen hat man ja Wertzuweisung. Und Herr Platzer hat jetzt eine kontinuierliche Wertzuweisung zugelassen. Quasi Sie können einer Variablen eine, äh, eine Funktion zuweisen, die durch eine Differenzialgleichung best bestimmt ist. Und, und das ist Ihnen gelungen, äh, in einer ja, wunderbaren Weise in der Logik einzufangen, die er Differential Dynamic Logic äh, genannt hat. Kleines D, großes L. Und äh, auch noch unterstützt durch einen interaktiven äh, Theoriebeweiser, Chimera. Äh, die Logik und der Kalkül sind von bemerkenswerter Prägnanz und Eleganz. Denn äh, häufig, wenn Leute etwas formal behandeln, ja, dann äh, geht es äh, auch völlig aus der Hand. Man hat enorme Verhaul von Formalismen und, und kann die überhaupt nicht mehr überblicken. Aber hier, ihm gelingt es ja, äh, da auch tatsächlich noch Beweise zu führen. Äh, also die Kraft der Logik, die eben äh, das unterscheidet von anderen Ansätzen, die sehr auf äh, automatisches Model Checking gesetzt haben. Also die Logik ist eigentlich was ganz äh, Neuartiges für die hybriden Systeme gewesen. Er hat dann 2008 in Oldenburg promoviert und ähm, hat sich dann sehr schnell äh, orientiert an die Carnegie Mellon Universität. Äh, dort hat ja Ed Clark, der große Meister des Model Checkings, schon <lacht> Gefallen an ihm gefunden und ihn auch darauf hingewiesen, dass er eine Assistenzprofessur wird. Ja, er hatte ja große Erfolge an der Carnegie Mellon Universität äh, ja, gehabt und ist jetzt, wie Sie schon ausgeführt haben, Humboldt, äh, eine Humboldt-Professur in Karlsruhe. Ich möchte noch vielleicht ein paar Punkte herausstreichen, die bei ihm besonders sind. Ich sagte schon, dass er die Logik nimmt. Statt Blackbox Model Checking für hybride Systeme ist etwas Besonderes, dass er über seine Logik Theoreme für relative Vollständigkeit beweisen konnte, eine neuartige äh, Definition von Vollständigkeit. Er hat sicherlich sehr viele Papers geschrieben, aber auch zwei Bücher, ja? ein, eine Monographie und ein Lehrbuch. Das Einzige, was man bei dem Lehrbuch vielleicht kritisieren kann, es ist viel zu lang. <lacht> 600 Seiten. <lacht> naja. Und äh, auch was ich toll finde, äh, das Werkzeug Chimera. Äh, Herr Platzer versteht es über die Jahre, ja, wie soll ich sagen, weiterzuentwickeln, zu pflegen. Weil häufig hat man äh, ein Tool im, im Bereich von Promotion, aber die sind nach zwei Jahren tot, ja, weil keiner mehr daran arbeitet. 
und Herr Platzer. Ihnen ist es gelungen, dass es weiter ja, in aller Munde ist. So ähnlich vergleichbar vielleicht mit Jupa, was Kim Larsen im frohen Morgen von Dänemark auch, was ihm auch gelungen ist für Realzeitsysteme, dass dieses System immer weiter entwickelt wird. Man musste ja auch geeignete Menschen haben und jetzt richtig anhalten und immer neue Ideen. Ja, das möchte ich zu Herrn Platzer sagen. Jetzt komme ich zu Frau Schwamberger. Frau Schwamberger hat in Oldenburg studiert und zunächst Mathematik und Kunst und Medien. Ja? Und dann erst hat sie gemerkt, eigentlich ist Informatik mein Ding, dann hat sie Informatik studiert. Und nach ihrem Master war sie von 2014 bis 2020 wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin, auch in der Lehre sehr stark engagiert und doch daran in meiner Arbeitsgruppe. Und sie ist auch im Bereich eines DFG geförderten äh, Projektes, kann man sagen, äh, war sie assoziiert. Wir hatten neben AVAX äh, den Sonderforschungsbereich für Automatic Verification and Analysis of Complex Systems, die ich bei Herrn Platzer angesprochen hatte, noch einen graduierten Kollegen, das hatte den schönen Namen SCARE, äh, SCARE für System Correctness under Adverse Conditions. <lacht> adverse Conditions. Ja, und äh, da war äh, Frau Schwanderger Kollegiate. Also das bedeutet, sie hatte eine Förderung, äh, ganz normale Landesstelle, aber konnte an, an den Dingen, die so ein graduierten Kolleg bietet, teilnehmen. Ja? Und äh, ja, ihre Forschungsgebiet war die Sicherheit im Autoverkehr, die wir äh, vorangetrieben haben mittels einer räumlichen Logik, die für den Stadtverkehr äh, zu erweitern. Weil der Stadtverkehr hat ganz komplexe Topologie. Ja. Zunächst hatten wir eine Autobahn, da fährt man immer nur geradeaus und dann ein Überholmanöver, dass keine Kollisionen kommen. Aber jetzt plötzlich um die Kurve äh, lenken und so. Und äh, das ist ihr gelungen. Und äh, das hat sie dann 2020 in ihrer Promotion niedergelegt. Anschließend war sie Postdoktorandin in der Arbeitsgruppe meines Kollegen Martin Frenzle und jetzt hier heute <lacht> Juniorprofessorin. Am Tipp. Bei ihr habe ich mir Folgendes notiert, was besonders ist. Ja, ihr, ihr Liebe, sagen wir mal, zur Kunst. Also für mich ist es immer noch sichtbar, wenn ich ihre Folien und ihre Poster sehe, dass sie da ein besonderes Händchen hat für, für so ein Design. Dann hat sie auch die Kombination von räumlichen Schießen mit dem model in Jupa verbunden. Logik ist ja mehr schließen, Model Checking rein automatisch und es ist ihr da gelungen, das zu verbinden, insbesondere nach einem Forschungsbesuch in Olborg, wo Jupa, der Model Checker, eben von der Gruppe von Kim Larsen gepflegt wird. Jetzt äh, möchte ich noch ein bisschen über die beiden, die wir heute in den Anfits vorlesen, äh, begrüßen oder ja, noch hinausblicken. Äh, Sie haben schon angesprochen, es gibt einige Beziehungen zwischen Oldenburg und äh, Karlsruhe. Neben Herrn Platze und Frau Schwamberger, die wir heute schon erwähnt haben. Ja, Sie selber, <lacht> Sie sind in Oldenburg geboren und jetzt hier. Aber äh, es gibt ja noch weitere Kollegen. Der Kollege Ralf Reusner, wo ist er da? Also, ja, da war er umgekehrt. Ja, er kam aus Karlsruhe und hat Juniorprofessur schon in Oldenburg ausprobiert. Er war nämlich 2003 bis 2006 Juniorprofessur, hatte eine Juniorprofessur in Oldenburg im Rahmen einer emmy nöter förderung durch die DFG. Ja, und er war angedockt an die Arbeitsgruppe Software Engineering von Willy Hasse. Jetzt ist er wieder hier. Dann Anne Kurzioli, ja, die hat auch, äh, äh, sie? Äh, da, ja, wunderbar. Äh, sie haben in Oldenburg studiert, ja, und Sie haben ja heute noch vorhin gesagt, ja, auch bei mir haben Sie die Vorlesung gehört. Und äh, jetzt sind Sie hier Professoren. Dann nicht nur Wissenschaftler äh, richten sich äh, gegen Karlsruhe, selbst in der, im Theater. Unser Generalintendant Christian Firnbach, äh, seit 2014 äh, Generalintendant des Oldenburgischen Staatstheaters, wird nächstes Jahr 
hier anfangen, als neuer Intendant des badischen Staatstheaters in Karlsruhe. Ja. Dann, äh, jetzt sieht es so aus, alle gehen immer noch nach Karlsruhe und macht dann ja ein bisschen traurig. <lacht> ich habe auch einen Beleg gefunden von einem Juniorprofessor für Wirtschaftsinformatik in Richtung Umwelt und Nachhaltigkeit in Oldenburg, Philipp Staud. Äh, der hat hier früher Wirtschaftsingenieurwesen und Wirtschaftsmathematik äh, am KIT studiert und auch hier promoviert. Dann äh, möchte ich den Blick noch etwas weiter schweifen lassen, äh, nämlich Karlsruhe schon lange bekannt als, als ein Forschungsstandort für korrekte Systeme und für Beweise. In meiner Zeit als Mitarbeiter an der Universität Kiel bis 1989 pflegte mein Doktorvater Hans Langmark bereits Verbindungen nach Karlsruhe, insbesondere zu Gerhard Goos und Peter Dorst. Inspiriert durch ein EU Basic Research Projekt, Prokos, Probably Correct Systems, hatte er eine DFG-Forschungsgruppe mit dem Namen Verifix, verifizierte Übersetzer von 1995 bis 2004 mit Gerhard Guß aus Karlsruhe und Friedrich Wilhelm von Henkel aus Ulm. Das ist ein Punkt. Dann äh, ist mir immer sehr geläufig äh, die Beweise, die hier entwickelt wurden. Zunächst äh, gab es ja in Deutschland eine, ein Schwerpunktprogramm Deduktion, äh, das, äh, soweit ich gesehen habe, von 1991 bis 1997 stattgefunden hat. Und, und danach sind verschiedene Beweise entwickelt worden. Und drei Namen sind besonders mit Karlsruhe verknüpft. Äh, der, das ist zunächst der Karlsruhe Interactive Verifier, KIF. Und ich freue mich sehr, im Publikum ist hier Menzel, <lacht> habe ich gesehen, ja, Herr Menzel hat äh, das, äh, ich sehe ihn jetzt gar nicht, aber äh, der ist einer der Initiatoren des Karlsruhe Interactive Verifier, das wäre jetzt weiter gepflegt wird von Wolfgang Reif in Augsburg. Dann natürlich äh, der Key-Beweiser von äh, Peter Schmidt und äh, Herrn Becker weiter äh, entwickelt. Und ich freue mich, Herrn Hähnle da zu sehen. Alle sind, haben an den Key-Beweiser und der Name lebt ja weiter, Chimera. Ja, also, äh, und dann gab es noch einen, einen dritten Beweiser, der hatte einen ganz merkwürdigen Namen von Herrn Deusen, Katzelwurm. <lacht> zusammen mit Herrn äh, Mitarbeiter Keufel. Also das sind so Namen, äh, die zeigen, wie wichtig hier dieses Beweiser war. Also ich wünsche Ihnen und mir, dass das KIT, äh, das Streben nach korrekten oder wenigstens erklärbaren Informatiksystemen und die Weiterentwicklung von automatischen Beweisern, äh, dass es hier weiterhin einen hohen Stellenwert einnimmt und die Berufung von Herrn Platzer und Frau Schwamberger sind für mich dafür ein erfreuliches Zeichen. Und ich wünsche den beiden alles erdenklich Gute hier in Karlsruhe. So first of all, I would like to start with Moin. So hello everybody, welcome everybody. Thanks a lot to my speakers before, so thanks for the nice speeches. So uh, I don't know what to say now. No, I don't. I, I do. I have something prepared. Okay, so I hope you will be amazed by my talk and I will tell you about my topic modeling and analysis in mobility software engineering. So with this, I would like to start from the very beginning. So not the complete beginning, but uh, so I will now maybe repeat a bit. So 10 years ago, I was searching for a master's thesis topic and I remember I was sitting in Professor Oldebock's office and he was telling me, something about a lane change controller and apparently it did not have a formal semantics yet and he was asking would you like to define a formal semantics for this lane change controller and little did I knew yes I wanted to and then this was so interesting that I just as Professor Alderock already indicated stayed and also developed the spatial logic that we have in Oldenburg and now also at KIT with me. I developed it also for urban traffic with intersections. So I think this slide was nicely summarized and, and better told by Professor Olderbock. So I will now come to 
The next part, so now here at KIT, it's of course not just me, so I have my group, so also one of my PhD students is here today. I also have an external doctorand who is in Oldenburg at the DLR Institute, and also uh, Petra Ufa, who is also here, I think, today. So it's not me, but I have also people around me working with me also on the topics I will tell today. So just to see where am I at KIT, so I'm in the Kastel Institute in the informatics faculty. So here are all my colleagues that welcomed me nicely into their ranks. And also I'm involved into the Innovation Campus Mobility. So probably you all know the Innovation Campus Mobility, but who doesn't? So it's a joint research platform between KIT and University of Stuttgart. And uh, also there's a lot more project partners, more than 50 I read on the homepage lately. So this is really a very interesting environment for me. So as you can see on the right, it has a lot of topics. And so for me, the topic software defined mobility, of course, is really interesting, but also the other topics um, are really fascinating to me. So it's nice to have such a big research environment around me. Also very important, so when I started in December 22 last year, so there was not, not only one junior professor from ICM, but also I started with another colleague, so it's Rania Reyes, she's also here today in the midst, so uh, this is actually great. So we are not something like uh, some formal team, but it feels like it's really great to exchange with you. So yeah, this is really great. So now we heard a lot about similarities of Oldenburg and Karlsruhe, so I don't want to repeat everything, but both also have yellow castles, as you can see here. So, and now actually I wanted to make some joke here about, uh, so when I looked for pictures of castles of Oldenburg and Karlsruhe, I found a lot in Oldenburg where it was not raining, but uh, the, the sun wasn't there, and in Karlsruhe the sun seems to be always there. So I, thought, okay, that's really interesting, so the weather is better here. But also, uh, in the last weeks, I was a bit critical about this. So basically, the park where I lived just went dead over the last week, so, so the grass was green, and now it's, it's very light. So, so I really enjoy the sun here in Karlsruhe, but it's a bit too dry. So this leads me to the topic of climate change, actually. So there's one interesting thing going on right now, so there's some performance of the Badisches Staatstheater together with the KIT actually, and also together with the ICM, which is really interesting. So last year it was the premiere, and the idea is that scientists from Karlsruhe are telling their stories about how they are working in the topic of uh, climate change or how their work could benefit this dangerous topic that we have here. And what I found really interesting, what I also only knew at the um, premiere last week, so it's actually three junior professors from computing science that gave some inputs into this piece. So it's not, so I was giving some inputs, but also Thomas Blesius and Pascal Friedrich, who also are both here today, I think. So this is really great. And as you can see, there are still some dates to watch this. You can find it easily if you just Google Nerds Retten die Welt and Badisches Staatstheater or KIT. And I can really recommend going here because it gives some nice train of thoughts around the topic. But also with them, this picture of the, the not green grass, I would like to motivate my personal research motivation. So it's not my hypothesis, but sorry. But what drives me maybe to work in the topic I am. So I'm working in intelligent mobility systems. And I like to think that if in the future we have more intelligent co mobility systems, we can actually help also fight this climate change crisis. So this is what I find really great about my topic and also about the environment at KIT actually. So there's a lot of research going on in this direction which I really find fascinating. So now the story of my talk for today is that we have a professor here and she wants to go to her inaugural lecture with an autonomous shared ride. So now the question is, okay, what does she have to do to be able to do so? Let's see. So first she recognizes, okay, I have to model the world. So my, my car is driving somewhere and I have to model this world so that the car also understands where it drives. So the idea is that we don't 
want to reason in the reality because reality has a lot of variables and a lot to consider, so we could not make proofs or anything, so we take this world and we abstract from it to actually allow machine readability. So the AVs, the autonomous vehicles, could really understand traffic situations, reason about traffic situations, and we could also do formal proofs in this environment. So that's the idea. And let's look at one intersection here. So the concept that I developed is the urban multi-lane spatial logic. So it's a spatial logic where you can describe traffic situations with, which, with, and if we now zoom a bit into this, so what does this formula mean? We can see it easily here. So basically the idea is we have job operator as we know them maybe from other interval logics. And the idea is that we can see here on the left, we have some reservation of a car named E. And then directly in front of that, there's a job operator, and this means there's some free space, but the free space is smaller than some distance to the crossing. And then after that, another job operator saying, and then there is a crossing segment. So this is the type of formulas we can actually make with the logic. And so what can we actually do with such a spatial logic? For instance, we could, of course, have now controllers that reason about traffic situations, but also we can formalize traffic rules. So my idea is that an autonomous vehicle must also understand traffic rules if we want them to drive safely in our midst in some future. So the idea here is we formalize the rules. This means that we have to expl explicate implicit rules of course, we have also to think about rules spe specifically for autonomous vehicles. So for instance, there's a traffic rule stating that we should not drive with sunglasses. Probably that rule we, we don't need for AVs, but there might be other rules we specifically need for AVs. So this means we're not just formalizing traffic rules, but also think further, what other rules do we need that are maybe not in our Straßenverkehrsordnung as we know it from driving ourselves. We have a lot of challenges here. So if we look at the Straßenverkehrsordnung or some other traffic rule book, there's a lot of imprecise terms, there's a lot of ambiguities, and there's a lot of formal conflicts actually. So if I would just go ahead and formalize everything without thinking, we just would have conflicts everywhere. So we have to solve a lot of conflicts. And also where my work comes in quite nicely, so I have this spatial logic, so this means I can formalize all those spatial aspects of traffic, spatial aspect me meaning there's a car in front of me or there's no car in front of me, but we also have temporal aspects in traffic rules. So for instance, a rule like uh, if you want to turn, if you want to change a lane on a highway, you first have to look into your back mirror, then you have to set the turn signal, and only then you can actually go on the other lane. So there's some sequence of actions you have to do. So um, we now model the world. So the second thing we should do is we should model the behavior, of course. So we want to have an autonomous vehicle. So we should think about how could it behave. And there, just to clarify, so my work is rather on the decision layer. So I'm not talking about how do sensors do things. And also, I'm not talking about how, to, how some motor works, for instance. But basically, I assume there are sensors that give me an input. And also, I assume if my um, controller decides something, then uh, this is actually done by motors. So if my controller says we can now enter the intersection, then this is done by the motors. So for modeling our behavior for the AVs, I use an extended version of timed automata. I don't want to go into more, too many details, but basically you can use this space, spatial logic in this controller so that the controller could perceive things like, oh, there's a crossing ahead. I now have to check some things before I can enter the intersection. We can also formalize our traffic rules with this mechanism. So this means also traffic rules have very often the structure that there's some detection part, something like, if there is a pedestrian crossing ahead, you have to do something, so give way, for instance. So this means we can actually nicely also formalize a lot of the rules using such an extended timed automaton. We also formalized the protocol for turn maneuvers at intersections. So this, the idea here is basically if a crossing is ahead, 
I have to check that no potential collision with any other cars would occur, and only if I check this and everything is free, I may enter the intersection. So this is a very brief summary, of course, of the protocol itself. So to summarize, we talked about modeling. So we had some mechanism. We have this spatial logic. We have seen abstract models for traffic. We have seen that we have to formalize traffic rules. And we have these protocols for doing maneuvers, like turning at intersections, or maybe also for following traffic rules. And now the second part, of course, we have to do, if the professor wants to come to her lecture with an autonomous car, she has to analyze the specification. So it's nice that we can specify a lot, but uh, it's still the question, is, is, it, is it good what we formalized? So let's look at this. The idea is we have this logic, we have the model, and now we want to have proofs, we want to use model checking, and we have different types of properties that we examine. The first one being safety, where now safety in this sense means uh, I now here have some statistics of the World Health Organization. So basically 1.3 million people die each year as a result of road traffic crashes. So this is a value from last year. And I calculated before how many, I think it was 150 deaths per hour, something like this. So a lot, so it's, it's really crazy. And also, um, it is stated what kind of risk factors actually exist for such um, road traffic fatalities. And you can see um, by my indication here, the green ones, it's basically all human errors. So it seems quite obvious that we can actually help to have more safety in road traffic to help the skill that the United Nations actually have by of halving the road deaths by 20 30, so they, the um, resolution is from 2020, and the idea was within the next 10 years we want to halve the deaths. So I think I remember I read this last year, we are not on the best way there. So after two or three years, it's not, not enough actually. So I now claim we can actually help towards this goal if we use intelligent autonomous vehicles. In my case, safety means it's something spatial in the sense that if a collision occurs, two cars are spatially in the same place, you could say. So this is why I call it a spatial property, which I can actually formalize with my logic and could also then, through the logic, actually prove that the protocol that I have actually is safe. The second property I also examined is liveness. So here now the motivation is, it's nice if we have a safe car, but basically I could have an autonomous vehicle that never moves, and then it's safe, but it also does not really do anything. So this means we want to have actually also something like liveness, meaning here, if I want to do something, my mechanism actually manages to do this thing at some point. The final version of this is bounded liveness, meaning that we don't just finally in 50 years pass the intersection, but we actually might past the intersection with some probability after two minutes or something like this. I could also formalize this, and now um, I examined this with UPAL and UPAL SMC, and this means that I basically um, formalized something like a liveness property using time computation tree logic, and could then also show that liveness holds for um, a version of my controller. I also examined fairness, fairness meaning not only should I always want to reach the goal of my car, but it's better if the cars sort of cooperate and if, in best case, all goals of all cars together are met. I don't want to go into details here, but instead I just skip to my next property, which actually is explainability. Now, explainability means there's some function maybe of our autonomous car, which is a bit surprising and we didn't think about this, so the idea is then the autonomous car should maybe explain something to us as a passenger so that we can trust the vehicle more. Or also, actually, so a lot of us here are computing scientists or engineers, so we have all sort of systems, and systems tend to get more and more complex. So they can do more and more fancy things, but they also get just more and more complex. So 
I actually also like the idea that with explainability, we could, the systems could explain themselves to us experts. So sometimes we also don't understand all our systems at all time. So it's not, not just explainability for end users, I would claim. So now here, um, I developed a framework with some colleagues. So here the idea is the system is observed and if something strange happens, it is triggered that an explanation should be given. And the idea of where does this explanation actually comes from is that if we already have system models, so I already specified a crossing controller, I specified something to formalize traffic rules. If I already have all these models, I should be able to get the explanation from this model. So I don't want to have some engineer sitting there and writing down explanations manually. This is just error prone and if the system updates, the engineer has to start writing new explanations. So we want to get these explanations directly from the models that we have and, and then extract them so that we can have some internal version of explanations. A very recent uh, cooperation, actually, this is already something I'm working on with another ICM junior professor. So this is um, Andreas Wortmann from University of Stuttgart, as well as a colleague from RWTH Aachen, Judith Michels, and we're working on making digital twins self-explainable, where here the idea is we have different system models to explain digital twins. This means that we also get several explanation models and have to think about how can we, if we have, let's say, 10 system descriptions, how can we still get one explanation model from this? So maybe some of the system models describe the same behavior. We don't want to have everything double, so we have to refine the models in this case. So the last topic I would like to briefly cover is morality. Where here I claim, so I said before, we have a lot of conflicts bef between traffic rules if we just formalize them, but also in different situations, new conflicts can arise. So I just have some examples here. So for instance, in some situations, we human drivers, when, when we drive, we just break traffic rules to help some bigger goal. So if there is some emergency vehicle coming, you're driving onto some greenery at the side to let it pass because this is more important at this point, although normally you are not allowed to just drive onto this greenery. So this means uh, then we actually break traffic rules. Also, we have conflicts between traffic rules and rules can be ambiguous, so it's not completely clear what they mean, but we humans, we sort of know what to do because we have this common sense. So now the question is, how can we bring this common sense into AVs? So this intuition, I can do this and that if uh, something bad happens. So um, the question sort of here is, if I would have moral rules, maybe I could decide these things. So the idea of we let the emergency vehicle pass, this is a moral rule actually. So the greater good is to have, to help save the person in the emergency vehicle and the other breaking the other rule does not mean something that bad in this situation. So the idea is that currently we are trying to classify types of conflicts that can happen when traffic rules are used. And then of course we want to find solution strategies for all these potential conflicts that can happen. So then something very important here, of course we have also a lot of dilemma situations. So a lot of you heard probably about things like the moral machine. So basically where a dilemma situation would be that the question is um, if a car has to either evade to the left or to the right and on the left there is two elderly people and on the right there is one very young person, where should it go? So this is a dilemma situation and I claim at least that I cannot solve this. So the idea is some of these conflicts have to be solved by experts. So not everything can be done and decided by the AV. This means that also here, I come back to explainability. It would help the experts, let's say lawyers or ethics experts, it would help them to solve the conflict if they would have more understanding of the conflict. So here explanations for lawyers, for instance, would be interesting where we're also working on with a colleague currently. So with this, I conclude for now. 
So we have seen mechanism to model traffic situations, to model behavior, and we have also seen methods to analyze actually some of the properties like safety, liveness, explainability, and also moral acting. So um, this is somewhat my first summary. I would also briefly like to say, so I'm also doing teaching, so currently I have a master lecture, which is called Time System. I'm also giving a pro-seminar, and I will very likely give a second version of Time System next term, because some of my students asked me if I could do something like this. So what I want to say with this, I'm also actually bringing my research into my teaching, which I really like to do. I really enjoy the research environment I found here in Karlsruhe. So these are just some institutions, some groups that I already have talked to, where I already found a lot of very interesting topics to work on together. So it is really great. So I had great discussions with colleagues from these institutes. I probably forgot some. So if somebody's saying, hey, we also had a very nice discussion. Why is my institute not here? I probably forgot this. So, um, but this was not with a bad meaning or something, please just tell me. And also, if you, we did not yet uh, talk, please, if you found my topics interesting, just uh, come up to me and we can discuss. So I'm really happy to do cooperations. So I have a lot of thanks. So of course, I would like to thank the other speakers today. So two we already heard, one we will hear later, of course. Andre, we will also still hear. Uh, Here's a lot of names. I will not say them all. So I really want also, of course, to thank you, audience, for being here. If you weren't here, it would be a bit strange of me to talk to an empty room. So it's great to seeing all of you here, that all of you followed our invitation. Yeah, so, so really, thank you also for the nice discussion. Thanks, my group, for always helping me out. So this is really great. Of course, also, thanks, Professor Alderock for supervising me during my PhD time. Also, thanks to Martin Frenzle, who could not come today, who also mentored me throughout my postdoc phase, and also, of course, sort of helped me to now be here at KIT in front of you. Last but not least, very important, she's not in the room right now, so Lawrence Bönke is currently organizing everything, organized also before everything, so without Lawrence Bönke, we also wouldn't be here, so she's really organizing everything, so whatever you will drink and eat in, in less than an hour, <laughs> so uh, she uh, organized that all these things are here, so say thanks to her, and uh, yeah. So uh, now this is my last conclusion. So uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, I still have a lot of research ahead of me. So this means uh, I was not able to, to create the autonomous vehicle to bring me here, but I think I'm on a good way. Also with all the help of you colleagues here and the other colleagues that are not here today. So I'm really happy to be here. It's really great. And yeah, so with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. I'll start with the thanks that Maike just ended with. So thank you, uh, Holger Hanselka and Sudika Olderok, for, for instance, for advising me, Holger Hanselka, for getting me here in the first place, Bernard Beckert for getting me here in the first place, but also Bernard Beckert and Peter Schmidt for uh, advising uh, my undergraduate thesis and master's thesis, because this is the requirement before you do a PhD thesis. Hello, my PhD students uh, from the US and so on. Doing a master's thesis usually is supposed to be a requirement before you do a PhD thesis, just so you know, FYI. Um, and in particular, thanks to all my friends who come here, traveled so long and far, uh, my students who came here from CMU and from LMU and all those places and so on. And also, I mean, Maike emphasized, I think, the research angle of how well the two of us, for instance, are welcome into the KIT environment. But there's also the personal level, right? It's, it's, I, think, I, I feel like the best possible research is the one you can do among friends. When you've got really brilliant people right next to you, you get along with very well, who then organize DFGs and the Forschungsbereich, tiny little things and so on, just directly in the direction that your research is into and so on. That seems like a very warm welcome, so I very much appreciate that. Um, but of course, um, 
I, I can't um, um, uh, do anything without Laurence Bönke either, who, who is running around outside managing everything and, and I, I have a small attack on you. I really hope that she'll ultimately be in the room with us and we can all thank her then. I don't know when she will have time to come here, but uh, I feel like it's not only the organizing, it's also even figuring out the right forms for an organization that has kept her busy for a little while. Um, I am privileged to be able to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is that of logic of autonomous dynamical systems. Um, and that is, uh, for instance, um, the dynamical systems analysis question to predict which control decisions are safe for aircraft collision avoidance, because if you're flying this plane, you should take care that there's other aircraft very close by and that everything inside this red um, shape here would be an unsafe control decision to follow and the only good predictions are the ones that go that way and that way and so on. This is by example the dynamical systems question where dynamical systems um, describe the mathematics of change um, and uh, dynamical systems pr describe the future. Uh, predictions for systems that already describe the future sounds like it's a triviality but there's a big difference. The difference is that the dynamical system describes the future only implicitly. It tells you, well, at the moment I'm going that way, at the moment I'm flying this way. Uh, but the prediction question is something long term. It's the question that says, if we sit on a plane that is described by this dynamical system, will we get out of there alive? Right? And that's very much a long term question and not just a question, you're going to be fine for a second as far as I can tell. Uh, and that's where the dynamical systems challenge comes from. Now, um, believe it from someone who just recently broke his foot in too much soccer. It turns out that motion is a present. But the presence of motion also requires us to look at the future of motion in order to predict where are we going to go end up. Is that free of collision? And that's something that's not just true in soccer, that's also true in the flight of aircraft or the motion of cars, or as trains run through the corridor environment. And in fact, that's where it turns out that Niels Bohr, of course, already said everything in much better ways than I could, because he said prediction, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. Sadly, it's only the predictions about the future that really help us. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm not going to talk about any of the many applications of the differential logic that Ernst Oldrock already gave away that I had my hands in developing those uh, has been good for, nor how uh, my students found 15 billion mistakes in the next generation airborne collision avoidance system developed for the FAA because I believe it is infinitely more important to emphasize what you do to then ultimately fix the problems and make sure that they're gone. In fact, I would also argue that uh, you should all be talking to my uh, students if you'd want mind uh, standing up for a moment. These are the people you want to talk to if you want to find out more about those applications because honestly they can tell you better than I ever could. But of course, I'm a logician. Um, which by, by, by heart, so that means when I talk about solutions and correct predictions about dynamical systems, I will do this in logic and I would feel I would um, take an extremely exciting opportunity away from you to appreciate the value and beauty of logic if I wouldn't actually show you lots of logical formulas. So Micah already showed you how to do, do that and I'll just follow in your footsteps. Differential logic, that's my baby and I believe it's important. It's not anywhere near as clever and as important as my son is, Leon, who was in the audience with me, but, but differential logic is also kind of important and kind of useful because you can use it to describe uh, the behavior of your favorite application and then ask prediction questions about it, and even better yet, ultimately actually answer those prediction questions. And I'll show this to you with my favorite example, which is the Wally robot. Uh, this is my favorite dynamical system, and this logical formula here, it's gonna turn into one logician, I promise. Uh, this logical formula here says all behavior of the Wally robot is such that Wally's position is different than the obstacle's position, and what that means is no matter where Wally goes to, while this position X, which yeah, will be different in different future states, will still nevertheless always be different than the obstacle's position. And that would be a good property to have because that means, hey, if Wally never collides, we can turn Wally on. 
Uh, unfortunately, for Wally, we need to become more precise what Wally looks like. Here's a dynamical systems program, it's called a hybrid program, with which we describe what Wally does. I'll read it to you. Here it says that if a certain step breaking point is true for uh, is a function of Wally's position and the obstacle's position, then I guess we change the acceleration variable to a negative value, minus b. And when we're done with this discrete dynamical control algorithm, then we're following a an entirely different mode of the system, a differential equation, which is a continuous dynamics. We follow the differential equation x prime equals v and v prime equals a. Wait, what does that mean? That means that we follow the time derivative of the position equaling the velocity while the time derivative of the velocity equals the acceleration. And in fact, that's mostly harmless. This is kind of the easiest possible differential equation you can write down, but it has the benefit that it fits on the slide. So that's the one I'll talk about. Now, here I have now the logical formula that says always when I do that and when I repeatedly do this, this is Kleene's star operator hidden here carefully for your pleasure to make sure that we understand that we iterate discrete and continuous operations to get this you know, trajectories like this. Then the question overall is, is Wally's position different than the obstacle's position? If it would be, it would be safe to turn Wally on. Sadly, this is not a true formula, but uh, it is only true under certain assumptions, yet logic is brilliant at managing assumptions with an implication. So if this is true, then the Wally robot is safe. And the assumptions at least have to include things like, it's good not to start in a collision state because we won't always be collision free if we start crashed up. Um, it would be very helpful if the brakes work and other things like that. But at some moment in time, you'll have sufficiently many assumptions so that this is actually a true statement. At which moment you would even better like to have a justification for why this is a true statement so that you can show your friends, about, tell your friends about it. Or maybe send it off to uh, TÜV uh, for the justification why the Wally is a safe robot to be using. Now, let's get more systematic, right? I'm a logician, I have to be systematic, so here we are. This is differentiating mean logic, and you can have assignments for primitive discrete change computation. Computer scientists are good at changing things, so this is how we do it with an assignment that puts a new value in the variable x. Uh, more importantly, to some extent, however, is the differential equation. x prime equals f of x. Uh, that we follow for a certain period of time, and so you all appeared to it in, in his wonderful speech before, within a certain evolution domain Q. So Q is describing how long we can do that sort of thing, right? Things like after 10 hours, maybe stop and do something else because it got boring. Or maybe when you're going too fast, maybe decide a bit differently. That sort of thing goes there. Um, and then uh, here's the programming language researcher in me, the, uh, the other operators, for instance, that of a choice. There's a choice between alpha for a beta. And for instance, when I'm flying my son's model airplane, there's literally no control over whether it's flying up or down. It's just anything happens. When my son is flying, flying it, it, there's a lot more cleverness in the flight. But even then, there's still the branching behavior. Sometimes he's flying up and sometimes he's flying down. Um, the sequential composition is that of one step at a time computation. So first, uh, we're doing alpha and then we're doing beta. For instance, first my son will fly the aircraft up to a safe altitude, at which point he will hand over control to me so I can fly with beta and not even me, me will be able to damage the plane anymore. Um, repetition is also very important. Uh, that's the cleaning star. That says we now do this over and over and over again. So for instance, it will take lots and lots of control cycles to correctly and safely uh, fly the model airplane all the way to the Paris airport. Um, but that was all just for describing the dynamics, and you can describe every hybrid system's dynamics in these programming languages. But we also want to qu ask questions about them in order to be able to form predictions about them, and that's where differential learning logic formulas come in. They start out like logic always does, for instance, with an implication, P implies Q, and quantifiers of the reals, never mind. But what's important is that for any dynamical system written down as a program, alpha, and for any differential mean logic formula, p, written down like so, is alpha box p and alpha diamond p, yet one more formula. And they mean that all behavior of the alpha dynamical system is such that the only states you can reach are the ones that are safe according to the condition p. Um, and beta diamond is sort of the dual. It says that if you just wait long enough, ultimately your airplane will have landed in Paris. And these two pairs of logical operators are brilliant for stating, for instance, safety is always good 
or liveness, eventually I'll be there properties. But now it's a full logic closed under all the operators, so you can start nesting things. And for instance, say there is a beta run such that all the alpha behavior makes us happy. And that's the level of nesting that you need to, for instance, express stability properties for these systems. And that kind of gives you an indication why differential living logic is sort of the logical lingua franca of control. You can ask any question you like. Um, and, and, and in a formally precise, rigorous way. Now, only being able to answer, ask questions is not as useful as also being able to answer some of them. That's where we're going next. But I could have given you lots of these picture intuitions in pure, beautiful math on this slide as well. I'm not going to do it. I just want to mention that this is easily possible by a simple inductive definition. OK, maybe I'll, now that you're all looking, I'll point out one point about it. For instance, you can say the meaning of a program that has a choice is just the simple function, a union of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And it makes some sense. You know, a program that has a choice between two behaviors, either there's one or the other, and nothing else. Right? And the point I want to make with this is that this is a compositional semantics. So the meaning of a slightly more complicated program is a simple function of the meaning of the pieces. And that compositionality in the very design and structure of the logic is exactly what we will be exploiting also for the analysis. Because it will enable us, if we do this right, to also prove in a compositional fashion, prove the whole system as a function of lots of little proofs about little pieces. Let's go exactly there. Proofs for dynamical systems. Here we are. It's these axioms of differential I mean, logic uh, that are uh, equations of truth, essentially. They equate this logical formula with that little formula, and they say the two have the same truth value, which means no matter where you are in the understanding of a system, you can simply replace things for their equivalence. It's like equality transformation. You can do this all day long. You're never going to change the truth value of it. However, the point is, by using it from the left to the right, you're also making it easier. Careful people might notice that it got longer. On the other hand, logicians will tell you, well, be that all as it may, the program is a big one. It's a choice. And here is lots of small programs. And I can only make things smaller finitely often. And then it will become trivial. OK, let's illustrate a little bit more. So here is this principle that a system that has a choice between alpha or beta will make us happy if and only if all the alpha behavior makes us happy and independently all the beta behavior makes us happy. And that really is self-evident. And that's kind of the point. All of those are very simple reasoning principles that you buy into once, and then you can just syntactically use forever. It's like the addition theorems of differential calculus. You understand them once, and you just use them from now on. Down there is maybe my personal favorite. It says that a system that repeats is safe if and only if we start safe. And no matter how far we already repeat it, if we are still safe, then we're safe in one more round. This is an induction principle cast into the principles of logic. Very beautiful. All right. Now, since Ernst Rüdiger Oldok mentioned it earlier this morning, I can't help but um, earlier today, I can't help but mention that. Oops, what's going on here? I can't help but uh, also admit to the fact that for the logic connoisseur in the audience, I would like to share briefly the soundness and completeness principles of differential logic, which not only means that every formula you prove in the logic is actually a true one. So every, it's called soundness. Every sound that a logician makes is sound. So in the sense that it's correct when they say that. But also the other way around. If it's true, there's a proof for it from very simple in comparison elementary properties of either differential equations or discrete dynamics. All right. Uh, let me let that sink in for a moment and easily step fast forward to the question, I guess it's then interesting to prove properties of differential equations. Because exactly as good as I could do that, could I prove properties of arbitrarily fancy, crazy, weird dynamical systems? And that's what we're doing next. There's two examples here. One of them says, um, if we start inside the green region, we will always stay inside the green region when we follow this differential equation, which I've plotted here for you, because that's easier to look at. Now, it is true, if you follow these vectors from anywhere inside the green region, you will always stay inside the green region. But you would like to have a proof if your life depends on it, which it won't for this example, but which it would if I had used the differential equations with an aircraft. And indeed, the classical mathematical reflex when looking at a differential equation is someone emails you a differential equation, the first thing you do with it is solve it, and then look at the solution. 
Sadly, that's the wrong way of working with them because that undoes the entire descriptive power of a differential equation. They were really only invented in order to describe fancy, crazy, weird processes in simple ways because they only look at the behavior completely locally. And I'm not the first one to say that. That is what Henri Poincaré already said in, in, 19, uh, in 1981. Uh, what is going on here? In, in 1981, when he called for the qualitative theory of differential equations, and in differential logic, can you look at the global properties of differential equations and prove them solely from looking at the logic of the local change? That makes them so interesting. Let's look at how. And the top, you see that uh, all behavior, again, uh, me with my logical formulas and so on and implications, but um, all behavior of a differential equation is such that an inequality is true afterwards, so E is greater or equal to zero, if E starts greater or equal to zero, and all the time the differential or derivative or something like that of E is greater or equal to zero. Well, it makes some sense. If you start above zero, your rate of change is above zero, I guess you stay above zero. Yeah, makes sense. This is the principle of differentiation cast in logic. Um, I believe there should be at least one new result per talk. Here's the new result. Um, this one says that for equalities, it's a bit different. You have an if and only if arrow. So in the future, inequality is true if and only if some stuff is true right now. And that's a property that logic and ancient lore and medieval times have in common. It's very important to pay attention to which direction the arrows go. Here, it's an if and only if. So it's true, the left-hand side is true exactly when the right-hand side is true. When it's for inequalities, it's only one direction. Um, all right, this is reasoning by differentiation. Uh, you can also reason by accumulation of knowledge, where you show that if I know that my system never leaves the region C, so in pictures, it never goes out of C, I might as well assume C from now on. I guess that makes some sense as well. If I know I can't leave C, it doesn't hurt if I assume it. And that's, however, formally an editing of the system assumptions. And editing of assumptions seems a priori like a very dangerous operation to do, but after you have a proof that it was okay, I guess this will pass. Differential ghosts is the most spooky of them all, but also my personal favorite. It now edits the differential equation itself. It changes the differential equation to a new differential equation, y prime equals a of x, y plus b of x, that was never there before, and we dream it up just in a way, in a way to make our analysis easier. Uh. Okay, why do, should that help? Look, this is reasoning by differentiation. This is reasoning by accumulation of knowledge. This is reasoning by editing or adding differential equations, which is ultimately reasoning by integration. And it turns out all three of them is the only thing you need in order to prove every true invariant of a differential equation in a sound and complete way. Uh, it's pure logical rewriting leading you to a decision about the predictions of the future. And it doesn't get any better than that. So, in fact, what you can logically, just simply syntactically derive in a computer is that um, an equation is true always in the future when following a differential equation. If and only if, here I come with my arrows again, a differentially transformed equation is true right now. And that's precisely an equivalence between future truth and present truth. And that's the card and soul and core of every prediction. You're trying to relate a property of the future to a property you can see right now. And here you have an equivalence between the two, which means you will exactly be able to tell which equations are true in the future and which are not true in the future. Now for inequalities and stuff like that, it gets a bit more complicated, it's written down there, but you get the basic idea, all right. I promise not to talk about any applications, so I'm not going to do that. Um, instead, I would much rather show you the principle that we're following, which enables you to do your own favorite application. And Ralf, I want you to appreciate in person that this is as close as a logician will ever get to a process, right? This is a genuine picture of what you do, so listen up. Um, you start with your favorite system, the one that matters to you, right? Um, you write down a model for it. That seems like a good thing to do because if you want to predict the behavior, you can't just say, ah, yesterday my car didn't crash, so I guess it'll never. You have to say, no, 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 no. What's the general behavior that cars can have? In order to be able to then, by mathematical logical proof, be able to predict everything that they could ever do. If that's then safe, 
that's the moment when I would personally feel comfortable to turn the key and start the engine. In particular, maybe go to sleep and let the car control handle it. And maybe don't do that. I need you guys. So, but the point is still, this is like how you should be operating along those lines. Um, then in our Chimera X theory improver, which uh, we already heard, is actually secretly, secretly based in all its ideas on the key prover, which uh, comes from KIT, for instance, and from Darmstadt and from Chalmers and so on, places like this. And with this, you write down a proof of the safety of the model of your system. Now you pat yourself on the back um, because you have a proof of correctness of the control according to your safety questions in the model of the system. But you could have written down the wrong model of the system to begin with, right? You wrote down the model of the system and not the system. Uh, okay, this is a fundamental challenge, but can be overcome as well with even more proof that you still do in Chimera to synthesize by proof a provably correct monitor of reality, which will then bridge any gap that could still exist between the model and the reality land. And then you're good. Let me summarize. Uh, let me summarize. Um, so, in logic, uh, you've seen the logic of dynamical systems, which is differential dynamic logic. Admittedly, it's the base case. I have a whole, whole pack of logics that can do more and more and more of those things. But the point is, differential dynamic logic is your logic of choice whenever you're looking at systems that have both discrete dynamics, so one step at a time computation, which is what computers and controls are good, and continuous dynamics, which is the thing that aircraft tend to be good at if you turn them on. They continuously fly through the air, or a robot that's continually wiggling on the floor. Hi, Tommy. Um, but uh, there's also extensions, for instance, for adversarial dynamics, whenever you have multiple agents that don't get along with one another, or whenever you have multiple agents that are possibly interfering in their actions and so on. And it turns out they're actually playing a hybrid game and no longer necessarily just following the dynamics of a dynamical system. Or you could have stochastic dynamics or autonomous dynamics, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. The point is, uh, in each of those cases, does logic give you an exceedingly strong analytic foundation to build on so that you can rest assured that everything you ever say is okay. Uh, you also have lots of roll up your sleeves practical reasoning advances in the theory improving land and that enables you to do exciting significant applications and bring lots of areas of science um, and, and engineering together. The key circuits and what I've told you so far is that logic and proofs uh, are exploited for dynamical systems principles that uh, there's a lot of compositionality principles from me being a programming languages researcher. There's a lot of secret tricks and cleverness in the theory improving land and exactly the important principle that systems are actually multi-dynamical systems. They're characterized by multiple facets of dynamical systems, discrete, continuous, adversarial, uh, autonomous, uh, stochastic, distributed, what have you not. Um, in fact, um, I also wanna uh, admit to a sad fact about logic that sometimes logicians just don't know uh, yet. <laughs> but the good news is if they know, if they say something, they actually know it because of the soundness, right? So, so there can be no confusion about that. I think also logic matters because there's nothing just like logic to discover eternal truth because, well, I have a proof. What could possibly go wrong now that I have a proof? Oh, reality, okay. Um, Henri Poincaré, of course, already said this in a better way. He said that it is by logic that we prove, but it is by intuition that we discover. So we need the logicians to be able to do all those proofs, but you need your intuition about the systems in order to guide the proofs and make sure you're running in the right direction. And in fact, this is, I think, also another thing I wanted to share with uh, you know, the young generation of, of junior scientists, the students, and so on. I personally at least believe that we need a few things for success in science. It's, I believe, a mix of inspiration and foundation because we need the inspiration to make sure we are running in the right direction and we need the foundation to make sure that we arrive in one piece and it hasn't all fallen apart. But we also need passion because we need, we're only at our best if we're following the things that really matter to us personally. And at least in my case, I found that. It's all this you know, game of logic and dynamical systems. Um, and in fact, just two weeks ago, a good, good, good friend, Dominique Mary, told me that uh, he found me out, or, except that I have made a mistake, and so we all the rock by calling it DL, a little DL, uh, differential aiming logic, because I should have called it DDL, because obviously, 
DD in French would have been the diminutive version for André, so the appropriate way of referring to me if I would be this tall and running around and giggling. Now, don't get your hopes up. I may still run around and giggle, but I'm a little bit taller now. Um, but in fact, the actual thanks goes back to my parents because they had the clever foresight of installing a differential operator right in my name. So it's clear that I'm doing the kind of research I need to be doing. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. But Bernhard wanted to uh, say something as well. Thank you. Okay, so finally, okay. you Michael, the other guests, friends, colleagues. Um, I want to say a few words on behalf of the faculty of the Department of Computer Science. Um, so, but don't worry, I'm the only one standing between you and food as the place of a pay, and I keep free. Um, I would like to thank both of you for these interesting and I think wonderful lectures. Um, at least from my point of view, wonderful because you managed to show that logic and deduction is not just some game that some people like to play around with, but it's actually the basis for reasoning about the world that surrounds us. I have a very important applications. So thank you for that. Um, today is, I think, a delightful occasion for two reasons. Uh, two reasons to be in front of us here. Um, on one hand, we are delighted to have a Google professor. Um, this is not something that happens too frequently. So a Humboldt professorship is an outstanding and rare success for any department, computer science department, and in any department in Germany. And so we are glad to have under here to strengthen our department. And this strengthening has already materialized to some important degree. So the, as, as we have heard, under is TI and the new CFG CRC that uh, Ralph Boisner is setting it with. Where is he? There. So, and, and that was already when we applied for, for, for this thing. So, and they helped us uh, uh, be successful with the application. And very importantly, has really taken, taken on the, uh, being a, uh, the spokesperson for the pilot program of core informatics, Scout Informatic, which is an important and also, I think, challenging task. So, thank you for that. Um, I think this, this professorship is a significant and important building block for the future of our department. And uh, as President Hanselka already said, there is an important kind of instrument for that, which is the Lotto Lima professorship. I'm not really sure who came up with this idea, well, someone in, in, in clarity. But anyway, it's, it's, it, I think it was a very clever idea to put that into the proposal for the um, Excellence University program. Uh, because that really kind of was instrumental to in getting Andre here, and also thank you for all the, as, as you said, all the effort and time, and, and, and also kind of money that we put into 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 making this possible. And now, on the other hand, we are also very much delighted to have uh, Mike here, yeah, to have been able to recruit Mike Schwamberger as a as a very promising young scientist for this junior professorship. And I, I want to say it's by no means the case that, that you are here kind of the supporting act for, for Andre. <laughs> um, uh, so so that, that's not how this works. So on the contrary, so the future of the department of the faculty and, and of any university lies in its young researchers. So promoting, establishing young researchers is a core task for us. And um, so when we have successfully filled the junior professorship, with promising uh, young, so young scientists, then we want to celebrate that and we gladly include the Humboldt professor as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as already was mentioned, also, Andre studied here in Karlsruhe, uh, like 20 years ago, his diploma thesis was supervised by Peter Schmidt. Um, he worked on the key tool, and so somehow this all worked out very well for us. Uh, so it was a good investment to <laughs> put, put some effort in uh, educating young Andre. Um, now, Michael, uh, please, please don't think I want to pressure you, so, but as your trip list turns out well, and it's like 15 years or 20 years. We are celebrating the Humboldt professorship or Schwerpunkt and Fridays or whatever it may be. And I'm still around and I'm still mobile and I'm happy to attend the celebration. <laughs> um, 
So, dear Michael, dear Andre, thank you very much. Uh, it was a uh, nice celebration, nice occasion. And I wish you continued success and a nice day, a nice celebration, and have fun.